So then today is the fourth Sunday after Easter. Because we're here in Pennsylvania, I guess, in somewhere near Erie. The epistle for this fourth Sunday after Easter is taken from that of St. James chapter 1. Dearly beloved, every excellent gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no change nor shadow of alteration. For of his own will he hath begotten us by the word of truth, that we may be some first fruits of his creatures. You know, my dearly beloved brethren, and that every man be quick to hear, but slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the anger of man worketh not the justice of God. Wherefore, casting away all uncleanness and abundance of malice, receive with meekness the engrafted word which can save your souls. And then the gospel, take that according to St. John chapter 16. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, I go to him who sent me, and none of you asketh me, Whither art thou going? But because I have spoken these things to you, sorrow hath filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go. For if I go not, the paraclete shall not come to you. But if I go, I shall send him to you. And when he has come, he shall convict the world of sin and of justice and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not in me. Of justice, because I go to the Father, and you shall see me no longer. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is already judged. I have yet many things to say to you, but ye cannot bear them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, shall come, he will teach you all the truth. For he, or he will not speak of himself, but whatever things he hath heard, he shall speak. And the things which are to come, he shall show you. He shall glorify me, because he shall receive of mine, and show it to you. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's okay. mm -hmm. So we're in the sacred time between the resurrection of our Lord and His ascension. And He is, and he is uh, he's speaking here, of course, His words are taken from Holy Thursday night, but they're words that He would have also spoken after His resurrection. And that is that that it, it, you, they, they, are they, the apostles were very happy at the Last Supper because Christ made them priests and bishops, because he gave them his first Holy Communion, because he told them very clearly that he is of good. They understood finally very clearly that he is God, and there was a great rejoicing. My Philip says, Now thou speakest plainly. Behold, now we know that thou art the Son of God. And so they're extremely happy, but then he lets them know, A little while I am not with you, and I go to the Father. And so that he's going to leave in a little while. And they are made sad. And he says to them, At that time Jesus said to his disciples, I go to him who sent me, and none of you ask of me, Whither art thou going? Because I have spoken these things, sorrow hath filled your heart. So a few considerations today. You don't ask where I'm going. And our Lord Jesus Christ, he speaks to his apostles. They want to be with him. And here is the challenge and the mystery of the physical presence of Christ. And now it is that we want to be with him. But it's something like when, a, when, a, when, a, when you're teaching a child how to ride a bike, or teaching a child how to walk, that the child is very, very confident when you hold his hand, and he is able to walk holding your hand. Or if you're very close by, and that way if the child falls, you can hold him up. Or if you're there holding the bike while he's riding, or he has a training wheels. But if it stays this way, the boy will never become a man. And if it stays this way, the boy will never be able to know whether he has become a man, or whether he does really love, or whether he really is a disciple, or whether he really is like unto his father, or like unto his teacher. So there has to be a time in which the, which the, which the master goes away. And this, in fact, is the whole history of the church. When St. Augustine was on his deathbed, they gathered around him and said, Augustine, don't die. And Mother Mariana was dying on her deathbed 1,200 years later. When she was dying, all of her sisters gathered around and said, Mother, don't leave us. 
And when the Saint, when Saint Dominic died, it was the same, and so with Saint Ignatius and all of the great founders of the church. When our holy Archbishop Lefebvre died, we said, don't leave us. But he died, and he left us. Now, why did they die? Why did the founders of our holy orders die? Why did the, the, those that started the work of God die? They, they, it's only after their death that it can be seen whether or not they were great teachers. It's only after their death that we can know whether or not they have instilled their ideas, their heart, their faith, their spirit into their disciples. Only after the death can this be known. As long as David is the king, and even the great Charlemagne. They say when Charlemagne died back in about 814 AD, it was perfect, wonderful Christendom for almost 50 years. It was the glory of Christendom, the most beautiful time in the history of the church that lasted the whole of his reign. When he was there, he made the priests be good. He made the bishops be good. He was a great, he was, he was a joy of the Pope. And he made a Catholic society through all of Europe. And he was the, Charles the Great was the great Catholic lord of a beautiful Catholic Europe. When shortly before, his grandfather was a very wicked man. And his grandfather, when he died, when Charles Martel died, the grandfather of, of, uh, of Charlemagne, St. Boniface was preaching a sermon on hell, or preaching a sermon on some point of everyone's going to go to hell. And he was yelling and screaming to the people in Germany. And he stopped his sermon in Germany. And he began to smile. And he began to feel with great joy. And he stopped his sermon. And he switched from an unhappy sermon to a happy one. And he said, my children rejoice with me. Because at this moment, Charles Martel has died. And he is in hell. That's how St. Boniface switched his sermon. And he switched to about the joys of heaven, the justice of God, and how wonderful it is that Charles Martel receives the breath of damnation. His grandson was Charles the Great. Charles the Hammer, the grandfather, and Charles the Great, the grandson. And Charles the Great, the grandson, was the exact opposite in every way of his great-grandfather. And he protected the church, and he was holy and wonderful in so many ways. He had human imperfections, but he was a truly great man, one of the greatest men in history. But what was the trouble? His greatness was in himself. His sons, one of them was Charles the Fat, and the other three, other two sons, uh, they were worthless. They were useless. They were totally worthless. And then there was his kingdom. They were good as long as he was there. But once Charles left, Christendom in its glory collapsed. And the Father, some saints speak about this glory of Christendom under Charles the Great, Carolus Magnus, Charlemagne, that he was truly great, but the Europe was not yet great. He was truly a man of God, but he did not was not able to yet pour that divinity inside of his children, inside of his kingdom, and therefore they were good under Charles the Great, just like the Jews were good under Moses. And Moses himself said, when I die, you shall become wicked. That's what Moses said. But what about Jesus Christ? Moses is the one that prepares for Christ. He is, the sacred scripture says of Moses, there was no man like unto him before he was born. There will be no man like unto him until the ending of the world. So wonderful was Moses. And yet he was too wonderful for those people that were around him. He beamed forth the light of the grace of God. But when he died, the Jewish people collapsed. They depended on him. And they depended on Charlemagne many years later. And they depended on other great leaders throughout many times in history. But our Lord Jesus Christ said to 12 wimps, one of them would die and commit suicide because he didn't wait for Our Lady. And that one is damned and in hell. If only he had waited a few hours later, he would have still been alive when our Lord Jesus Christ said, Woman, behold thy son. And he would have received the grace to not commit suicide. He would have received the grace to repent. And he would have become a great apostle. But he committed suicide an hour too early. And now he's damned in hell, Judas Iscariot. 
But the other 11 apostles were not much better than him. They were also cowards. They also ran away. They also betrayed him. But what did our Lord Jesus Christ say? It is for you, not the 12 of you. It's for the 11 of you that I go. It is for you that I go. Some of the saints point out to us, when Christ says you, <coughs> it's not always the southern version. We always say y'all. Y'all means you all. It's just plural for everybody. We don't always say y'all, right? So the fact is, he is not you all, but you many. Not you all. He is not going to say you to all, but you to many. And so we have a situation here where our Lord Jesus Christ is speaking. But who is he speaking to? It is most necessary for you, not you, Judas, but for you, eleven apostles, that I go. It's necessary for you that I go, because as long as I'm here, you will not be able to understand. You're always going to go to Daddy. You're always going to look for those training wheels. You're always going to look for my hand to be out to hold you up, and you'll never become apostles. In fact, this happened in the life of St. Louis de Montfort. St. Louis de Montfort only had three priests with him when he died. And these priests heard confessions, and they didn't like preaching sermons. Everyone came by the thousands to ascend St. Louis de Montfort's preaching on, the, on Our Lady and is bringing people back to God that converted in the sermons. And the three priests with him, they were his disciples. They belonged to his order because his order had so many troubles. He only had three priests in him when he died. He was so persecuted by the Catholic Church. And these three priests were not really special men. And he said, don't worry, when I die, this order will grow, it will spread. You will spread Our Lady throughout the world. Well, he died. And then there was another French parish priest, very smart man. He said, I'm going to have you, I want you to come and preach about Our Lady. He said, no, we don't do that. We're the ones that hear the confessions. We're the ones that meet the people afterwards, do private consultation. We don't preach the sermons. We can't do that. Lewis always did that. He's dead. We're not going to do it. He said, don't worry about it. Don't worry at all. I've got a famous preacher coming from Paris. Father so-and-so is going to come. He's going to preach a sermon. I just want the three of you to come hear confessions like normal. But the old priest lied. He wasn't an honest man. <laughs> so they came in to hear confessions. And he, right before he said, oh, darn, the other priest didn't show up. <laughs> I got thousands of people out here, and I don't know anything. You're the one. You got to preach. So we can't do that. I know, but I don't know what happened. What happened was he never called the priest and he lied. <laughs> he forgot to mention that. But he said, "I don't know what happened, but you got to get up there and preach." And they were had a they had a no total mental breakdown, and they got up and preached. And what happened? The people converted to Christ. Many young men joined the the order of Saint Louis. And the order grew and expact, it grew and waxed strong. And they found out, you know what? Even without Lewis here, and even though we're not preachers, and even though we're not talented, and even though all we can do is hear confessions, give private consultation, if we're stuck, what are we going to do? And St. Louis proved his greatness as a saint by those three untalented men able to bring Christ to souls. So our Lord Jesus Christ says, it is most necessary for you that I go. What about now in the situation of the church? It's necessary for you that I go from the tabernacle and you can't receive Holy Communion anymore. It's necessary for you that I go from the church and you can't go to Mass all the time anymore. It is necessary for you that I go to heaven like Archie Lefebvre did and let you stand on earth and see if you can keep my spirit. See if you can keep my doctrine. See if you can hold up the faith while I go. It is necessary for you that I go. Not for you 12, but for you 11. And in some cases, not for you 12, but for you 1. For you 2. For you 3. Which ones? Only for these small numbers. Christ's power is not in Christ. Christ's power is in his church. Christ's power is in those weak disciples, those weak apostles. It is not a special thing if Jesus Christ in his divinity walked this earth and performed miracles and was perfect everywhere and every city was like Jerusalem that he walked 2,000 years ago. And he individually came and appeared to every individual like the Protestants say. 
St. Augustine would say that the religion of Protestantism can best be defined as the religion of pride. Because what is it? The Protestants believe, I'll talk to Jesus, but I'm not going to talk to a shepherd. I'll go to Jesus, but I'm not going to go to anyone else. You know who, who was the first person to say that? His name was Lucifer, the chief of all the angels, the bearer of light himself, the most beautiful of all the angels, said, I'll go to God, but I won't go to anyone else. I'm not going to go to the mother that he's going to have on earth. I'm not going to go to his church. I'm not going to go to the humanity of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to do that. I'll only go to God. Lucifer was the first Protestant. There's nothing new under the sun. Protestantism was founded in hell on the very first day, as every other false religion was. And it's the religion of pride by which I will not go to the number two. I won't go to the disciple. I won't accept what the servant has to say. But Lord Jesus Christ said, this is not my way. I speak to the people, says Jesus Christ, and hearing, they do not understand. And seeing, they do not see. That's what I do. And I speak to you, twelve apostles, in secret. And I explain to you what those parables mean. And your duty is to go out there and tell them what it means. And they will understand when you explain. Like the teachers in the Peanuts cartoon. Wah, 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 they will understand the teachers in the peanut cartoon, whereas they won't understand the teacher of teachers. And why did God make it that way? Because, as St. Jerome says, the religion of the devil is the religion of pride. And why is that? It's pride that made hell come into existence. It's pride that made man fall. Therefore, how do we fix it? Humility, humility, humility. And what does humility mean in practice? It means to listen to an idiot. It means to listen to someone who's weak, to listen to someone who's a fool, to listen to someone that doesn't fully understand. The teacher is teaching the class, the students learn, because the teacher is one chapter ahead. He's one chapter ahead, and the student learns. It's interesting how we human beings are, because many students are so much more intelligent than their teachers. They know so much more than their teachers, but if they don't go to the teacher's class, they won't know anything. And so they're more intelligent than their teachers, and yet they still need to go to the teacher's class, lead, listen to him read through the notes, and somehow they learn, because God made things that way. It is most necessary for you that I go, and you are sad. Now, why are you sad? There's two reasons why he must go. One is because God intended that we only learn from disciples and not from masters in order that our pride be conquered. And secondly, because of the disciple themselves, the disciple must understand that I can read the books, I can go to the seminary, I can learn all the theology, I can learn all the philosophy. Do you know that every modernist at Vatican II read the same books we read now in a little seminary in Kentucky? They had the same books. St. Thomas Aquinas, Summa Theologica. They had the old classic authors, St. Robert Bellarmine. Same books. What happened? Those books had written truth in them, but that truth did not enter their hearts. They were not ready to die for that truth. They did not love that truth. That truth did not make them to be saints. That truth did not lead them in their lives. It was just something to learn in a book. What led them in their lives equals what makes them survive, and that's getting by. And the king says today, you're going to get by by teaching Jesus as God. So I'm going to be a good priest. I'm going to teach Jesus as God. And the king says tomorrow, you're going to teach that Jesus is only a man. Okay, no problem. He's only a man. What's the difference between priest B and priest A? Not much. Priest B teaches Jesus Christ as man. Priest A teaches Jesus Christ as God. Why do they both teach it? Because that's what's expected before Vatican II to teach that he is God. After Vatican II to teach he's just another man. What's the difference in the priests? 
Not much. That's why you notice thousands and thousands of priests, maybe a hundred thousand priests, a few hundred thousand priests in the world in 1965, and they didn't like, they didn't know how to say the new Mass. And when the new Mass came, they didn't like the new Mass. And when the new teachings came, they didn't like the new teachings. And 99.99% of all those priests went along with it. Why? Because they were the same priests in 1960 that they were in 1980. They didn't change. Their vestments changed, but they didn't change. The subject of their sermons changed. Why? Because before they used to pick up this old book and read out of that one. Now they pick up a new book and they read out of this. Then they read out, read about, read out of the new one. But they haven't changed. They didn't learn Christ before and they don't know Christ now. And the vast majority of priests are not pleasing to God because they don't ever learn from Christ's absence. It is most necessary for you, says our Lord Jesus Christ, to eleven, not twelve apostles, and to many, not all priests. It is most necessary for you that I go, and when I go, the paraclete will come. What does paraclete mean? The comforter. Who needs comforting? Only those in sorrow. You don't need comforting if you've got a nice spot in life. If you're in charge of everything, you get everything you always want, and you have no crosses, you don't need a comfort. It is most necessary for you, for me to go in order that the comforter may come, the paraclete. And the paraclete is not just a comforter. He comes from very high, and we are very low, so we must be in great sorrow. And then the comforter will come down, and he will comfort us, and he will fly down from above like a dove. In his gentleness, he will come down, and he will comfort us. And when he comforts us, we will begin to understand. Because Christ's word is not only text. And it is not only doctrines. It is divine life. And life requires both the skeleton and the bones of doctrine. And the flesh of love. The flesh of charity. And without both, if you have a skeleton, you've got a dead body. If you've got flesh, you've got a dead body. But if you have skeletons and flesh properly connected together, you have a living man. And our Lord Jesus Christ, truth is alive. It is not only flesh with no skeleton, which is worthless. It is not only a skeleton with no flesh, which is also useless. Though the skeleton is in better shape because you can put the flesh on the skeleton. The flesh without the skeleton is nothing you can do. But the fact is... It is most necessary for you that I go, and I'm going to go up into heaven, and I'm going to teach you. The paraclete is going to come, and he's going to comfort you. And what's he going to do? He's going to teach you all the truth. Notice what he says. He's going to teach you all the truth. Now, Lord Jesus Christ spoke all truth to 12 apostles. All 12, including Judas, had the power to perform miracles. All 12 were made priests and bishops. All 12 could celebrate Mass. All twelve could hear confessions. But all twelve did not believe in all the truth. He doesn't say, I'm going to teach you a whole bunch of truth. I'm going to teach you all truth. The Holy Ghost is going to teach all truth, which indicates that partial truth is not enough. Because truth is just like the hull of a ship. If there's one hole in it, one hole in it, it sinks. Or like a balloon, one hole and the air goes out. But if there are no holes and all of it is intact, then air can be held in the balloon. If the boat, if the hull is completely intact, then the water can be kept out of the boat. But it must be all truth. And hence, when we go to the seminary, we teach young seminarians, make sure you know all the truth. There are 12 articles of the creed. Know it well. Because at this stage, you don't know what love is. At this stage, you don't understand what pain is. But you must understand the bones of the faith and the truth. And then some of you will become apostles. Some of you will become disciples, not all. Some of you will be Judas. And the devil has known, the Christ is known rather, not only the devil, Christ is known. And at the beginning of the church to its very ending, there will be Judases. Notice that the first Judas, he was not even a full heretic. He was a traitor. And what is it then that some Judases will be heretics? 
Some Judases will be extremely bad, but other Judases will only be traitors. And what is the result of this betrayal? Jesus Christ is crucified. He is brought away from, from, from the souls, and that many much blood is shed from the mystical body of Christ, and the blood goes out, the souls that will go out and be damned. Why? Because of Judas's betrayal. There will be other souls, the blood will go out and sanctify, but not every soul. It is most necessary for you that I go. And what's going to happen? The paraclete is going to come after you've had a little pain, after you've had a few crosses. You need these crosses to learn to become strong. Like the athlete must be able to lift weights. He's got to be able to lift weights. He doesn't like the pain of running. He doesn't like the pain of, of all the exercises he must do. But he must experience those pains in order to be a great athlete. And our Lord Jesus Christ is going to make athletes for every age. And we must be the athletes for our age. It is not, not for us to say, we're going to wait for more athletes to come later. It's not going to say, we can't be like the athletes of old. No, there is a race to be run. The baton is being passed. Every man runs his miles on the race and he hands over the baton. The next one picks it up and he runs. And just like in baseball. You got your nine guys that are going to hit the bat, hit the ball. The pitcher usually stinks. He can't hit the ball. Well, what are you going to do? You got to put him in the lineup. The pitcher still has to be in the lineup. Maybe he can throw a ball. He just can't hit one. But the fact is, I don't care if you're a pitcher. I don't care if you're the you're the left field guy. You have to be able to hit. Your time is going to come to the plate, and all nine guys got to get in line. All nine guys got to hit the ball. And in the race, everyone's got to carry the baton. Maybe the fastest will be your first guy. Maybe the fastest will be your ninth guy. Maybe the fastest will be number three. All the coaches got to decide, where do you put your fastest? Don't worry. Where do you put the fastest? Well, the fastest is one, two, three, number nine. Doesn't matter. He's going to be put somewhere. But all nine have to race. And so when we go into the battlefield, our Jesus have taught us, here is a truth that's handed out to me by my fathers. The holy truth of the gospel carry it to the world. I had to stand up against the Pope. I had to stand up against bishops. Are you ready to stand up against your superior? Are you ready to stand up against the, one, the ter errors of the modern world? Only you can do that after I am gone. Not while I'm here. Everyone's going to be good while I'm here. But after I'm gone, who will stand for the truth? Who will persevere? And St. Louis de Montfort, his order grew after he died. The same also in many cases with St. Ignatius. The order really grew after he died. And so it is with our Jesus Lefebvre. The society survived so many years before it actually had its collapse. So many years after he died. In a great and horrible fight. In which the whole world is trying to destroy our faith. And this showed the greatness of our founder. The greatness of our founder is not that he himself was great. The greatness of our founder is that he was able to preserve the faith after his death in those that were his disciples, so that, the, so that those four bishops who collapsed, unfortunately, as time went on. But what did they do? They maintained the faith for many, many years before the collapse came. And then also the faithful, what did they do? They persevered for many years. And not only that, but it continues. Right now we are continuing the work of the Society of St. Pius Saint Marian Corps. We are continuing the work of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre which is the work of continuing the Holy Catholic faith in the great time of crisis. And the Son must imitate His Father in the absence of the Father. And the paraclete will be the one to come and protect us. And right now in the church, souls are being asked, can you be without Mass for a little while? Can you be without the sacraments for a little while? Can you persevere without these things for a little while? You cannot persevere without my divine truth. You can't persevere without my divine love. But don't worry. When you don't have Christ for a little while, there shall come a paraclete. Today I'm supposed to be in Canada. But I decided that I'm not an essential worker. It wouldn't let me cross the border. Couldn't go into Canada. You know, so the thought it was going to be allowed in. Turned out, not allowed in. And so there are souls today, about 50, 60, about 70 souls, who are not going to get the Mass. They're not going to get confession. They're not going to get the sacraments that they were hoping to get. But what is going to happen? The paraclete will come. The paraclete will comfort those. 
Stand firm for the truth. Our ancestors had many crosses. They had many difficulties, but they persevered through them. And so likewise, we must have some crosses and some difficulties, and the paraclete will come and comfort us and teach us all the truth. And then what's he going to do? The history of the next 2,000 years. And that is, what is he going to do? And the paraclete shall... And I tell you... <clears throat> But I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go. For if I go not, the paraclete shall not come to you. For if I go not, the paraclete shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he has come, what's the paraclete going to do? He shall convict the world of sin, of justice, and of judgment. The paraclete is a dove. The paraclete is the Holy Ghost. He does not use a mouth. How does the paraclete convict the world of sin? of justice and of judgment. The paraclete enters into the soul of the priest of the church. He enters into the soul of the bishop. He enters into the soul of the pope down the last 2,000 years. And those that are faithful to God, those that have Christ in their hearts, those that have needed to be comforted by a few sorrows in their lives, they will receive the comfort of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost shall speak through the mouth of priests. He shall speak through the mouth of bishops. And through the mouth of priests and bishops, they will convict the world of sin, of justice, and of judgment. And that's the duty of the priest down the last 2,000 years, to be the voice of the Holy Ghost, to convict the world of sin, of justice, and of judgment. And that and he was going to convict the world of sin, and of justice, and judgment, of sin, because they believe not in me. That's our first duty. When I first meet you, and you're not a Catholic, and I first meet you, and you haven't been to church for the last 25, 55, 75 years, you are to be convicted of sin because you have not believed in God. The Hindus don't believe in God. The atheists, the Muslims don't believe in God. The all false religions don't believe in Christ. They don't believe in the true God made man. Therefore, we've got to convict them of sin. You are in sin because you do not believe in Christ. And when they understand that they must believe in Christ, and they leave behind their sin, then we must convict them of justice. And then they shall be convicted of justice, because I go to the Father, you shall see me no longer. And here we tell the souls that have entered into the true faith, you must have justice. You will not have perfect happiness here on earth. Perfect happiness will come when you see God face to face in heaven. And therefore, the Father, Jesus Christ, goes to the Father, and we will go to him, and we will see him, and we will have great rejoicing in our hearts. You must be convicted of justice. Don't try to be good and live happiness only in this world. Goodness is a preparation for the next life. Therefore, there must be a conviction of justice. First of sin, because they don't believe. After they believe, of justice, because he goes to the Father. And then the third conviction is of judgment. And then you will see me no longer. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is already judged. And he will be convicted of judgment. And the judgment is the prince of this world, who is Satan. He is already judged. He will be defeated and purged out of your soul. You will go through the seven stages of the interior castle that St. Teresa of Avila spoke of. You will go to the three degrees of the supernatural life that the Father speak of, the purgative and the illuminative and the unitive way. And you will find at the end that the devil is, the dead prince of this world is judged and he is condemned and he is wiped out of all your mortal sins of your life, wiped out of all the venial sins of your life, wiped out of all the deliberate imperfections of your life, and he is filled, and, he, and Christ has filled you with a divine love, and Satan is judged. And he is burning down in hell, and you have lived out the judgment before it came. Because what's going to happen on the last day? On the last day, when the world comes to an end, all of hell is going to be crunched down in a little spot in the center of the earth, in the center of the earth, did a mathematical analysis a couple years ago, and that uh, 10, 6, uh, 8 billion bodies take up a cubic space, 8 billion human bodies take up approximately 1.5 mile by 1.5 mile square. So you can squeeze them in pretty tight. You put all the bodies together, and all the souls in hell are going to be squeezed in a physical space with their bodies and all the damned in an area about 3 miles in diameter. And that's hell. That's how big hell is. Smaller than most towns. It'll be packed with all the damned and packed with all the souls of the damned and packed with all the devils and that's the kingdom of hell. 
a physical space about three miles in circumference, I mean in diameter, in the very center of the earth, 8,000 miles, 4,000 miles beneath my feet right now. A very isolated and forgotten place, judgment. And outside of that place, all of Satan's touch shall be purified and wiped away. And there shall be a most beautiful and peaceful and wonderful place. For the duty of the priest is to convict the world of sin, number one, of justice, number two, and of judgment, number three. And that's the conviction of the just. He shall also convict the damned. For if they stay in sin, they shall lose all justice. And if they lose all justice, they shall be judged forever with the damned, with the prince of this world. And so the sin and justice and judgment, conviction of the saints, that the devil is driven out of their lives and they go and become saints. The conviction of the damned, that sin deepens into their life and all justice is taken away and they are guilty and to be found uh, uh, condemned of every judgment until they are found themselves of the devil in hell. And that there must be necessary, it is necessary that the paraclete come and he won't come unless Christ goes. And therefore Christ goes, Christ goes, and Christ goes. And lastly, the wisdom of Mary Magdalene. Did Jesus Christ go? He said, it's most necessary for you that I go. I'm leaving. I'm going to heaven, and you won't see me till the end of the world. Is he telling the truth? Because he's going to be in blessed sacrament in only a few minutes. His body and his blood and his soul divinity is going to enter inside of each one of us. He said, like a father says to his son or a mother to the child. The mother speaks to the child and says, you can't have any cake at all until dessert. All right, one piece, little brat. Don't ask again. <laughs> I told you you can't have any cake. All right, little brat. Don't ever ask me again. You can't have any cake. I said you can't have any cake. Okay, little brat. Don't ever ask me again. Now i got to make a new cake, you brat. <laughs> That's angry mother. Then there's angry father. I'm sorry, I'm not going to be with you. Let me hold that for you. <laughs> I'm leaving. I'm going. I'm going. I'm going. I'm going. How come I can still hear you? I told you I'm going. <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ said he's going. How far did he go? He said, you won't see me until I come back. Well, I won't see his extended six-foot body, but I see his body more often than the apostles saw it every time I celebrate the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And I hold and touch his body more than they ever touched it. And yet they say, you will not be able to touch me. As the wise Mary Magdalene went to embrace Christ, and what did Christ say to her? Noli me tangere, you cannot touch me now, for you will not touch me with perfect happiness until hereafter. But what's happening? What is happening? She is touching the risen body of Christ. St. Anthony, the greatest preacher of the world, what did he ever do? One day they went and saw him at the church. The church was locked up. And they looked at the keyhole in the church. And there was St. Anthony standing at the side of the altar, right here at the gospel side. And there was Jesus Christ as a baby standing upon the altar. And there he was speaking to the baby Jesus, the child Jesus. And he held Jesus in his arms sometimes. He placed upon the altar other times. And he spoke with him, spoke with him through the night. That's where he got his ideas. So our Lord said, I'm going to go away. And I'm not coming back. But we don't believe him. He complained to his apostles one day, Why did you wake me up? I was sleeping beautifully with a nice rolling of the waves. <laughs> And you woke me up because of a storm. Did they say they were sorry for waking him up? No. They weren't sorry. And was he sorry that they woke him up? Maybe not. He got up and he stopped the waves. And so likewise in our crisis in the church and our crisis in the world, we know that the Holy Ghost comes to us, the Comforter. We know that Jesus Christ must go away for a little while. But he's going to come back on the last day. And between now and then, he'll make a few secret visits. So many. Unofficial visits. He sees us in the Blessed Sacrament. He sees us 
when we're dwell in heaven, indwelling in our hearts with the Father and the Holy Ghost. He sees us in visions of the saints. He sees us in all kinds of ways. But he still said, I'm not coming back. He need to not lie. He's not coming back in his full extended six foot body until the ending of the world. But he is coming back in his full body, unextended inside the Blessed Sacrament. He is coming back in his body by way of apparitions many times. He is coming back in his grace. He's coming back in his words. He's coming back in his, in his miracles. He is coming back in all kinds of ways. So much so that when his body shows up, how different and how more wonderful will it be? We will find that Jesus Christ is always with us and that he said, I have to go, and he does go. But he doesn't fully go. He doesn't ever completely go because he will be with us until the consummation of the world. And he said that too. I am leaving. I am leaving, he said on that Ascension Thursday, but I will be with you until the consummation of the world. Which one is it? Is he way up there in heaven, or is he still with us now? And we will discover at the end that he's never really left us. He's always with us. And he sends the paraclete, and he watches over us at all times. And we must have confidence in our little crisis. That we must be ready to accept a few small crosses, a few small crosses, so as not to be able to receive Holy Communion all the time, not to be able to go to confession all the time, not to be able to go to Mass all the time, but we should always love God all the time. And he will take care of us and forgive us our sins and strengthen us. The paraclete will come and make sure that we do not die without the grace of God in our hearts and that we will always be able to receive Christ usque ad mortem, all the way until death, until the time we go into eternity to be with him and his mother forever. Who bless you all in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.